but it's nice to see all these people that we usually don't see in the last 18 months. So thanks for the invitation. So my talk will be about five DSCFTs. We already had this beautiful introduction by uh, Syria earlier today. So a lot of things will kind of repeat themselves. And what I'd like to focus on are, again, symmetries. And we already in the last talk heard that it's interesting to look at the global forms of flavor symmetries for 4D theories. Um, and so one of the questions that we'll discuss today is, in five dimensions, you could ask for five DS CFTs, what are the global forms of flavor symmetries, but actually there are also these higher form symmetries. And in fact, these higher form symmetries together with the flavor symmetries um, can form higher group structures. And so the goal of this talk is to explore what we can say about that in the context of 5D. And this is work uh, based on a series of papers, starting with some work uh, with Dave Morrison, who actually also spoke this morning, and Brian Willett. And then the paper that this talk is largely based on is with these fantastic three postdocs uh, in Oxford, Fabio Puzzi, uh, Laksha Bardwaj, and Giovanni. So I actually just realized that my pen doesn't work, so I might have to, one second, just connect that. Okay. So what is the motivation? As I said, we, I think a lot of the audience doesn't need to be reminded that 5 DSCFTs have an extremely rich structure of flavor symmetries. And in fact, the enhancement of the flavor from the IR to the UV is one of these sort of things that keep a lot of the research going, understanding exactly how that happens, uh, how the U1 in Santon actually, uh, together with these sort of classical flavor symmetry we see on the Kumon branch, enhanced to some uh, say, for example, we saw this in the last talk, the exceptional flavor symmetries. Um, the precise enhancement depends on, in particular, the instanton particle. So I think now you can see my pointer, right? Okay. So a lot of progress on that question, just the flavor symmetry, and I'd be more specific, the algebra uh, for these uh, has gone in from both the geometry, so engineering theories and M theory on a Calabial threefold, but also the brain webs from which we can also read off the flavor symmetry algebras. And of course, the superconformal index from where we can also determine the flavor symmetry enhancement. And starting with the work by King, King and Lung. And the Higgs branch is sort of another realm that has in the past few years have become sort of a source of understanding flavor symmetry enhancements, which is sort of goes by the name of these magnetic quivers. They determine the Higgs branch, the Coulomb branch of the three dimensional n equals four theory determines the Higgs branch of the 5D SCFTs. And from the structure of this Higgs branch, the foliation structure in terms of symplectic singularities, we can also read off the flavor symmetry algebra, at least so the non abelian part. And so this has led to a huge number of papers, uh, in particular, determining what exactly the enhancement is. So a question arises well, is that all we know about the global symmetries in 5D? And of course, the answer is well, not quite. So for example, what is actually global symmetry group of the flavor symmetry? When you look at the rank one theories, is that really the ENF plus one, or is it that quotient at by center? And we've seen actually in Cyril's talk that in four dimensions, when you reduce them, you see the center quotient. And you'll see something very similar like that also in the 5D setting. And the second question is, really with the advent in 2014 of all these higher form symmetries, higher group symmetries, uh, are these structures present also in five dimensions? So that's where we're going to be so making some progress in this talk. So looking at sort of the 5D uh, geometric engineering, um, basically I think we, it's relatively straightforward how to determine the one form symmetry. And I'll explain that a little bit, um, but there's, so from the geometry, a very straightforward way to just extract what is the one form symmetry of 5D theory. And there's been so a lot of progress in the past years determining those structures, computing potential anomalies for these uh, symmetries. Um, and in fact, then sort of in the last few months, we sort of realized, in fact, there's also potentially something called a two group. So when you have the flavor symmetry algebra and the one form symmetry, and when you look at these two symmetries, they may not actually form just a product group, but they may form something which is called a two group. 
right? So that's an example of what's called a categorical symmetry, where you actually, the zero, morally speaking, you should think of it as the zero and the one form symmetry uh, are not just forming some product symmetry, but something more elaborate. And I'll explain uh, in a bit more detail what that entails. Okay, so what I would like to do is, because there are many different ways of thinking about 5D, and I'd like to actually explain this from all possible angles. So there are geometric people, there are more web people, more field theory people, and this is sort of a nice place where all these methods come together. And it's actually quite striking that all of this can be discussed in the simplest theory. So SU2 with level zero. So just the simplest uh, cyber theory already has a lot of that structure. And so we don't need to go into any kind of fancy theories. Okay. I actually don't know how the questions work, but if there are questions, please just unmute yourself and ask. Okay, what's the plan? I'll just discuss a little bit of background on higher form symmetries and then discuss them in 5D, how we see them from the geometry, webs, the field theory, and then finally, uh, this two group story. Are there any questions so far? Okay, so. What is a higher form symmetry? Well, in 2014, um, Gayoto Kapust in Cyber Bullet told us we should really think of symmetries not just as, as the structures where the charged objects are point like, but actually we should also broaden our horizon and allow for Q dimensional objects. And so a Q form symmetry, gamma, has charged objects of dimension Q, and the symmetry group is generated by co dimension Q plus one topological operator. And then these charged objects transform under this group by sort of computing a certain linking of these two types of operators. So if you reduce this to Q equals to zero, that's just basically local operators, so point like, and they're charged um, under co dimension D minus one uh, operators. We can surround with a sphere of co dimension one. Um, the point and compute the charge. And even for Q equals to one, this is not something that we haven't heard, uh, right? These are just line operators, so Wilson lines, for example. And there's, for say, a pure gauge theory, you can think of these as just coming from the center symmetry of, uh, say, a gauge theory. So they're charged under the center symmetry. And the charge operators are of dimension uh, D minus two. And then there's also sort of the dual magnetic Toft operator story. Okay, so this is just the basics of higher form symmetries. Examples are, of course, for the pure gauge theories. Uh, if you just look at a simply simple um, a setup, so we have a pure gauge theory, uh, some gauge algebra G <clears throat> with simply connected gauge group capital G. And then basically the set of line operators can be characterized by. So the weight lattice modulo the root lattice, and then the magnetic weight lattice modulo co, co root lattice. And both of these quotients are just isomorphic to the center of the simply connected uh, group G. So now, if we stick all of these line operators into the pure gauge theory, and those will actually, as we exchange these, will pick up phases. So in fact, uh, depending on actually the Dirac pairing of the, the, the charges of these, these line operators, so in fact, to get a theory where we have just so mutually local line operators, we have to pick sort of a maximal subset uh, that is mutually local and uh, so a consistent set of lines that we can insert in the theory. So basically the one form symmetry in that kind of context is just uh, called this maximal set lambda, then the one form symmetry is just the harms from lambda into U1. So we have some charge uh, under this. So in fact, for discrete symmetries, it's just a discrete symmetry again. So for example, for SUN, we have a ZN one form symmetry that can be gauged fully. We get the PSUN theory. If N has some non-trivial divisors, we can also gauge uh, ZK subgroup, et cetera. And that gives a whole range of interesting global forms of the gauge group uh, in four dimensions. Another example that you'll be familiar with is the 62,0 theory of type ADE. And that has a two form symmetry. The charged objects are just the strings um, and the two form symmetry is given in terms of uh, just the abelianization of gamma ADE. So that's sort of 
uh, the simplest examples where we already knew what these higher form symmetries are. So if we have a global symmetry, uh, a zero form symmetry, we can study backgrounds for these the symmetry and equally for P form symmetries or Q form symmetries, we can uh, uh, look at the backgrounds and these are now um, P plus one forms. So if we have say gamma P, then in fact, uh, background field for this is a P plus one form, which is in this cohomology of space time X, but now with values in that P form symmetry. So this, for example, could be a ZM. So for our purposes, most of these discussions will be that gamma P is a discrete symmetry. And then gauging that will require summing over all these backgrounds. So it's summing over all these possible Bs. So for example, in this way, we can go from the SUN theory, global SUN group, gauge group, and get to PSUN by just summing over these backgrounds. So a lot of the literature has focused on 4D and also in lower dimensions. So there's a lot of activity in condensed matter uh, related to these symmetries. And in 5D and 6D, um, this, this series of papers by Kodova, Dimitrescu, and Tilligator so there cannot be continuous one form symmetries in an SCFT in 5D or 6D. So this means if you, uh, there you assume you have a current and then you can so study from just a conformal field theory point of view, whether there can be such symmetries and they have a no go theorem there. But here, the, the point is that most of the symmetries we'll be looking at are actually discrete. So in 5D, um, we'll see these are all similar to the center symmetries in uh, four dimensions. Okay, so in five dimensions, how do we actually uh, even start studying these two types of symmetries? Well, Cyril told us there's the Kuhlman branch where we have some IR gauge theory description and we could start just looking at that and look at either a non abelian gauge theory locus on the Kuhlman branch or the really generic point where the theory is a U1 with some matter. Charge matter. So from that point of view, right, if you have a gauge theory, again, and simply connect the gauge group G, uh, the same arguments as in four dimensions go through. We have a center electric one form symmetry um, given by V G. Now, if the group is not simply connected, in fact, in five dimensions, we get a two form symmetry group. So then dual to the one form symmetry is a two form symmetry. We can again pass from one to the other by gauging and so summing over these types of background fields. And so in, in five dimensions, uh, um, one form symmetry, once I gauge that, I get go to a two form symmetry and vice versa. So that's sort of a purely gauge theory point of view. If we now have a simply connected gauge group, purely on null theory, these are just the center symmetries and there's nothing more exciting going on about that. And of course we have, if we have add matter to these pure gauge theories, if the matter is charged on the center, you will actually break potentially the, the one form symmetry. So if you have SUN with fundamentals, uh, one of the theories that many in 5D will look at, they don't have any one form symmetries. But spin N with NF will, for example, have a Z2. And of course, what's also interesting in 5D, you have uh, instanton particles, they can also be charged. And so they can also break the one form symmetry. So you have, for example, an SUN level K theory that actually we have a one form symmetry just from the center as the N, but actually the instanton particle can break that to the GCD of N and K. And similarly, the theta angle breaks the one form symmetry. And so the SPN uh, zero will just have a Z2 and with pi will have nothing. And so you see here already for the SP1, which is the SU20 theory, we get a Z21 form symmetry. Okay, so that's just gate theory on the Kumon branch. And what we really would like to know is what about the SCFT, right? So usually we then have to take some one of the methods, how we study the strong coupling of these 5D theories. And one way is, for example, to look at them in terms of M theory genetic engineering. And the other is in terms of brain webs. And I'll discuss now how we see these one form symmetries from these constructions. So in M theory, uh, in fact, I will sort of just briefly recall how we construct these CFTs. 
So we have a canonical singularity, so Sarah already gave an overview of that. You can look at M theory on a singular, so non compact Hanabi L threefold. And the boundary of that will be a five manifold. And the standards of geometric engineering dictionary tells us compact divisors will give us gauge degrees of freedom because we have one one forms. We can reduce the C3 of M theory on these one one forms. Those will give us sort of gauge bosons. And then there are wrapped in two brains, which are uh, BPS. They can wrap compact two cycles and give uh, particles. And the mass depends on the volume of these cycles. So going to particular loci in this scalar modular space of the Calabria threefold, these particles become massless. And for example, can lead to enhancement of the gauge group from U1 to some non-abelian one, or they'll just be matter uh, charged in states. So this is the story that you usually will hear if you, people do M theory, uh, geometric engineering in 5D, so you wrap compact cycles. But these are Calabiaos that are non-compact. So also you have in the topology of these non-compact two cycles. So these are relative two cycles, which basically extend to infinity to the boundary. So if you wrap M2s on these non-compact or these relative two cycles, these are actually infinite mass particles. And so one way of thinking about this, these are just world lines of infinitely massive particles. So these are actually line operators. So that's smelling more like one form symmetry. Now, if we have local operators that can screen line operators, those lines we should remove from the one form symmetry. And so basically that leads you then to conjecture that the actual one form symmetry from this geometric point of view is take this relative homology of these relative cycles and then mod out all the stuff that's local operators. So H2 of Y6. And this quotient here is basically what is the one form symmetry for the, so to speak, the theory um, that you've considered or constructed using this Columbia uh, Y6. And note that at this point, I haven't really committed yet where I am in this multi space. I'm at the Coulomb branch, and the Higgs branch, and the CFT point. So concretely, this is a really nice formula. It looks more complicated than it is. And just because we have a color Biao, this is very simple to reformulate this with using Poincaré duality in terms of just intersection data. So when you have a color Biao threefold, one thing that's easy to compute is the intersections of four cycles, so the divisors, compact four cycles, and compact two cycles. And in fact, this quotient here can be just rewritten in terms of this quotient of z to the b4, so the four cycles, modulo, some matrix, times the lattice of two cycles. Where this matrix here is simply the intersection of all the compact four and two cycles. And that's uh, once you have resolved the singularity uh, in computation, that's extremely uh, straightforward. So most of you might be more familiar in specific examples um, with toric color the L3s. And so this construction here of this intersection matrix actually has a very simple um, manifestation in terms of the toric color the Ls. So if you look at the toric fan, you define it in terms of these external vertices on the lattice, they are also internal vertices. Those would correspond to the compact divisors. They'll determine the rank of the theory. And then we can further, by looking at this toric diagram, applying this general algebraic geometry formula, reduce this to an extremely simple combinatorial statement. Take all these vertices, stick them in a matrix, and then compute the Smith normal form of that. And that the Smith normal form just tells you there's some integral transformation. You can make, you multiply it from the left and the right with some integral matrix, and then it'll just become a diagonal matrix. And here the diagonal entries are these alpha one, two, and three. And the one form symmetry for this toric models are always of this form, that there can be three cyclic groups, uh, with, which are determined by simply the vertices of this toric diagram. And once you have that, of course, the path now to the brain webs is very straightforward as you have whatever your toric diagram and then you just take the dual graph 
And from there, you can read off the five brain charges. And reformulating this toric story in terms of the brain webs is just nothing. Take your brain web, put the charges of the five brains uh, into this matrix, compute the Smith normal form. That actually gives exactly these integers alpha one, two, and three, which then compute the one form symmetry. Right, so these are the PIQI or the five brain charges uh, of the external five brains. And they can also be, in fact, um, sort of more um, intricate things that you, for example, you can uh, remove certain vertices on your lattice. So this is sort of what um, Benini, Benvenuti, Tertikawa was called white dots. So you have your toric lattice. And then, for example, you remove one of these guys here. So that's not completely known what that corresponds to in the geometry. You can do that in a brain web. And in fact, it does not change the one form symmetry because you're just removing something along that uh, N edge. Okay, so from now both geometry, toric geometry or brain web, there's sort of a very straightforward way to extract what the one form symmetry is. And one thing that is nice is sort of all these expressions don't seem to necessarily depend on where you are on the Coulomb branch um, of the theory. So let's look at an example. So let's look at SU20. Um, I can realize it, for example, like this. And then I can go to a higher rank. So I've drawn here several toric diagrams. This isn't confusing. And then the Smith normal form of this matrix here is just given in terms of 1, 1, 2. So there's a Z to 1 form symmetry. And now we can repeat this for SUN level K. And that gives just the GCD. So that confirms what we expect from the Coulomb branch VH theory description. Now, there's a nice way to reformulate this. So at the moment, we're still using sort of compact divisors and curve intersections, even in the toric thing that's just rewriting that intersection number. There's a direct way of thinking about this just in terms of the boundary geometry. So if you look at the quotient that we're interested in, so it's the quotient of this homology group module that. So these were the non-compact two cycles, these are compact two cycles. In fact, there is a way to think of this as feeding that in the long exact sequence and relative homology, but that, that group here, the quotient, is in fact nothing other than the kernel of the map that passes on. So this is now a map here, H1, of the boundary into H1 of the bulk, the, the column here. And so that's the kernel of that map. It's isomorphic to it just by exactness of, exactness of the sequence. So that sits inside the one cycles of the boundary fivefold. So it's all the one cycles on the boundary that become trivial as you extend them into the Calabial bulk. And now many Calabials don't have one cycle. So in fact, very often it's just fine to compute the H1 of the five dimensional uh, boundary geometry. And if you apply it now for the SUN level K theories, um, the boundary there is actually space, many of you know, just in terms of you know, how uh, holographic doors and so on. So the, the boundary of these toric Calabiales are just Sasaki Einstein manifolds, and they have no one cycles. So in fact, just computing H1, uh, the Calabiales in the bulk don't have one cycles. And so H1 of the Sasaki Einstein just gives the one form symmetry. So that's a nice observation then that a lot of this is just determined by what happens on the boundary of this space. Um, this is only variant, obviously under internal kind of geometric transitions. You can do flop transitions, you can blow stuff up, blow stuff down, nothing changes. And also blow stuff up, blow stuff down means you can do UV dualities in 5D. So for example, the one form symmetries will just map across dualities, UV dualities. So these are two gauge series that have the same UV fixed point. Both of them have trivial one form symmetries. And here we have a Z2 one form symmetry, both of these, um, and that also checks out. So for all we know, um, that seems to indicate that actually the one form symmetry is actually property of the, also the singular geometry. Right. In the end, once you compute the link, you don't commit to actually looking at any resolution. So that presumably will tell us that the actual one-form symmetry is 
something, some genuine property of the UV fixed point. So that's basically what I'm saying here. And then we also saw earlier today the this uh, non-Lagrangian theory. So this, what I mean by that is there are theories, of course, in 5D that on the Coulomb branch don't have a non-abelian gauge to description, like the P2 theory. And they can also have one form symmetries, which you can compute now just using this geometric analysis. Or in fact, if you want a sort of brain map analysis. Okay. Are there any questions? about what I've said so far. Okay, so one comment I have is uh, just before we get into the nitty gritty details of higher groups. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of six, uh, 5D SCFTs descend from 6D on a circle with mass deformations, like with holonomies turned on or with twists turned on. And so one question you could ask is, can we then map so from the higher form symmetries in 60 to the 5D ones? And indeed, if we start in 60, 1 comma 0, um, we can have both one form symmetries and two form symmetries. So the two form symmetries are like in the 2 comma 0 case that I discussed at the beginning. So they just come from geometrically uh, curves uh, in the base. Um, and then there can be also one form symmetries they come from tuned elliptic fibers, so gauge theory sectors um, on, well, in the fiber. And of course, they can be, uh, they could contribute, so any gauge factor contributes a center symmetry, but then we also have often matter that can break that. So the simplest actual sort of examples where there is both a two form and a one form symmetry are the so called non Higgs book clusters. And maybe so the simplest example is, say, SU3. On a minus three curve, so we have an, uh, a fiber tuned that realizes an SU3 gauge theory on a minus three curve. This here will contribute a uh, two form symmetry and that contributes a one form symmetry. There's no additional matter. So then we get just the sum of these two as the total sort of higher form symmetry uh, of the theory. And in fact, it's an interesting question whether that's actually a group or something we, we can discuss later. And then uh, reducing that on a circle, now the strings can wrap the circle or they can not wrap the circle. So that gives rise to either an electric one form symmetry or two form symmetry, and then the one form symmetry just descends. So the total one form symmetry that you expect from, for example, this case is a contribution from both the two form and one form symmetry. Now that's not the whole story because these higher form symmetries can also be emergent. So as you actually look at, so actually, uh, as you look at RG flows, you decouple matter, um, the one form symmetry, in fact, always uh, at most, um, so it will, will increase at most, it will never decrease. All right, so now um, I alluded to this, this potential question that if you have a symmetry, say a zero form symmetry, one form symmetry, then in fact, these can form some non-trivial two-group symmetry. So I wanna discuss for the rest of the talk a little bit what that entails in five dimensions and how this sort of should be thought about. So what are these two-group symmetries? They arise when you have a zero and one form symmetry and they don't form a product group, um, but something more akin to an extension group. So if you look at just a, some group theoretic problem, you can have Z2, and two Z2s, and they can now either form the Klein four group, Z2 times Z2, or they can form an extension group, which is Z4. And in this case, the Z4 is not isomorphic to Z2 times Z2. So there's a non-trivial, what's called an extension sequence. So what we'd like to sort of discuss is an extension, similar where now one of these is actually the, the one form symmetry, this is a zero form symmetry, and then there's some kind of it's not anymore a group here, but this is some extension of these two. And then see also what are the implications of that. So in the continuum case, um, these higher group symmetries are not that unfamiliar. Uh, so if you look at supergravities and you look at higher form fields and their gauge transformations, you'll see many that their gauge parameters will mix. And that's sort of the continuum version of what a higher group symmetry would be. It's just that here we'll be looking at discrete 
symmetry. So the one from symmetry is actually always a discrete symmetry. So that we have to somehow extend that. And that was what was discussed in a series of papers, starting with these papers here. Um, and in this paper with, with uh, Fabio, Laksha, and Jiwan, we looked into all these single nodes, 5D SCFTs coming from single node gauge groups, and determined what are actually the two group symmetries. And one of the important ingredients in this analysis is actually knowing what is the global form of the flavor symmetry group, because that's actually what will participate in this two group. So that gets back to this question from the beginning, actually, what do we know about these global forms of the flavor symmetry? And for now, we have to actually look a little bit into the details under the hood of what these curves, how the symmetries are actually realized in this geometric setting. And there's also similar sort of brain wrap version of all that. So actually, the, the first thing to define is what's called a structure group. It's just basically the largest faithfully acting global symmetry group of a theory. So you have the gauge group, G, and then let's call F the simply connected flavor symmetry group. And then we mod out by this group E, which is a subgroup of the centers, ZG and ZF. And that's the maximal group that acts trivially on all the fields. So that's all this stuff that's redundant. And then once we look at this quotient, that should then have sort of the property that that's every element in that faithfully on the theory. So what I want to consider is now how exactly from this structure group, we read off, for example, the flavor, the, the global form of the flavor and also the one form symmetry. So if you have this group E, we can either project because it sits in ZG and ZF, we can project it to G or we can project it to F, call that E prime and Z. And in fact, of course, the one form symmetry embeds into that because the one from symmetry essentially sits in ZG. And then we can also project that onto, pi, on, onto the G factor. So then the one form and zero form symmetries are simply F modulo Z. So that's a projection of this group E onto the flavor part. And the one form symmetry is just all the elements that of the form something non trivial comma zero that are generated by that. Okay. So for SU2, zero, so I promise we'll look at this in just in the simplest possible case. And the SU2, zero theory, let's look at whether that actually, what, what it gives for the zero and the one form symmetries. So here I've drawn actually the slightly different diagram before I was drawing the one that's this. This is the F0, uh, this is the F2. And both of them give rise to the um, rank one SU2, zero theory. Uh, it, this one is slightly nicer because you actually see the non-abelian flavor symmetry uh, from this additional vertex uh, on this torque diagram. These are sort of equivalent up to decoupling some flavor. So what this is, is we have one compact divisor that's an internal vertex, and then there are these, these corner guys, and then, as I said, there's this additional non-compact div divisor that intersects that, and that's called an F. Um, what I should just notice this is terrible notation. Uh, let's call this sort of something like, um, actually, let's call it N as we always do. So N for non compact. And essentially, the non compact divisor and S1, so this compact divisor intersecting at minus two curve, and that's going to then uh, give rise to the non abelian flavor symmetry enhancement. In this, in this uh, geometry, F2, so that's just a Hertzberg two surface. So it's a P1 fiber of a P1. Um, we have two curves, the base and the fiber curves. That's E and F. And now I can compute just from the intersections, the toric geometry, or however you like to do this, um, how they intersect with S and with N. And these give us these charges here. So to actually now compute what is this flavor symmetry group, well, we know this first F is just SU2, that's a simply connected version of the flavor. And then we also can now compute from this matrix of intersections, uh, in fact, that this is sort of, again, there's a Smith normal form involved, like in the, this sort of is a recurring theme, can put this into a basis where this matrix is diagonal four comma one. So in fact, 
this maximally trivially acting group is Z4, and it's generated by one quarter one inside U1 times Z2. So now we said we have to project this onto uh, F, so that gives a Z, so that's a Z2. And the one from symmetry is projecting it onto one half zero, which is a Z2. So those are the trivial, that's basically the elements, right? There's also a quarter one, the quarter one actually is not trivial in this ZG, in the, in the second factor. So in fact, the only element is, that's of the type something comma zero is half zero. So there's a Z2 one form symmetry and this group Z is actually Z2. So if you remember, so this gets fiddly, but stay with me. The flavor symmetry group was, was F over this group Z. So in fact, from this analysis, we learned that the flavor symmetry group is in fact SU2 over Z2, so it's SO3. And that's in fact confirmed if you look at the super conformal index uh, by Kim Kim Lee, for example, for the SU2 zero theory, you could read off that in all these representations are in fact SO3. You will not find an SO2 representation. No, no, it's been half representations. And there's also another way to sort of confirm this is from an anomaly as in this paper. So another thing I should notice, these groups, Z2 uh, for this projection from E to the flavor symmetry part and the one form symmetry, they in fact fit exactly into this kind of extension group. So there's a Z2 one form symmetry, the Z2 from here from the zero form symmetry part and they form this group um, E. So that already starts smelling like there could be some kind of group, two group structure. Okay, so to actually study whether there is a higher group or not, we have to look at the backgrounds for the symmetries. So for example, if you just focus on the zero form symmetry, you just learned the flavor symmetry is SO3. So in fact, all the bundles, all the, the we can turn on should have a non-trivial class V2 that measures the obstruction of lifting an SO3 bundle to an SU2 bundle. So that's a class in H2 of the space time with Z2 coefficients. And it's just a, a characteristic class that measures this obstruction. And now in the presence of such a, a V2, in fact, also the gauge bundles will have an obstruction. So the gauge bundle G mod Z4 will have an obstruction to lifting the G mod Z2. And that class is in fact the same class. So V2 is just a class in H2 and with Z2 coefficients where Z2 is this one here. So that measures that obstruction. Now that's sort of the zero form symmetry part. Now the two group comes in when you also want to turn on backgrounds for the one form symmetry. And I said at the beginning, backgrounds for one form symmetries are elements in H2 valued in the one form symmetry. So in our case, again, Z2. But now this is this orange Z2. So this is basically now in this extension, we are turning on sort of backgrounds for these two V2s and that's sort of where the two group structure will come in that they actually form this extension. So this is just to remind you what all these different groups are. And um, we said we have, we would like to now turn on a background for the one form symmetry. And so putting all this together, we have this obstruction for the gauge bundles, we have the obstruction for the lifting the, the flavor symmetry bundles. And these are basically all the different classes that are at play here. Right? So this is the SO3 to SU2 lifting. This is the analog and the gauge bundle lifting. And then this here is the one form symmetry background. And so now this was the structure of these, these groups. So get the one form symmetry, the zero form symmetry part of E and E form this extension. And then there is in cohomology, what's called a, a non-trivial map from in fact, this H2 with values in Z to the H3 with values in gamma one. And I'll tell you in a second why that's relevant. So normally you would say the variation of B2 should be trivial, but in fact, what this extension or, the, or this map, this non-trivial map tells you, if this map is not trivial, is this Bockstein map, that this variation of B2, which is delta W2, is in fact the Bockstein of the class that you turned on in here, right? So in V2 prime is this class here. So in fact, we turned on a non-trivial class uh, in this, there's a non-trivial map to this. And 
in fact, that tells us that delta B2 is in fact a function of the background for V2. So in summary, basically, this gives a non-trivial two group whenever you have an element, which is the Boxstein map from this kind of cohomology now actually applied where we, this is not M, but actually the classifying space for the bundles. So in our case, BSO3 with values in the one form symmetry. So the backgrounds for the zero form symmetry, so lifting the, the F bundles to the, so simply connected the bundles F is measured, is, is sort of giving you a non trivial background uh, for the variation of the uh, one form symmetry background. So actually, let me go to the example, and I think this will become much clearer. So we said for SU2 zero, we have the one form symmetry, the Z2 that sits in the zero form symmetry part, and they form this extension. And then we have a W2, which is just a Stiefel Whitney class now that obstructs lifting the SO3 bundles, the SU2 bundles. And in fact, there's a like the box thing of this W2 is non trivial. That's just the third Stiefel Whitney class. And that's a variation now of this background for the one form symmetry group. So, background for the zero form sort of talks to the variation of the background of the one form symmetry. Note that if, in fact, we go and here it was crucial, the flavor symmetry is, in fact, the non abelian flavor symmetry. Um, so, this is crucial. For example, if we went to a generic point on the Coulomb branch, we would have here instead BU1, and then these extensions actually would be trivial. And so then there's a question, we now seem to be say, seeing a non-trivial two-group structure at the SCFT, maybe at the Coulomb branch of the SCFT, but then in the actual gauge theory description, there is no uh, two-group. And so there's perhaps some room to actually say, well, can we actually give some more support as to why there should be such a distinction between the CFT point and, and the Coulomb branch. So the question that arises here, and it's been some ongoing discussion about that, um, is there a two group or is there no two group? So what could be sort of the potential um, counter argument? As I said, there, there's no two group on the non-obian gauge the locus. And in fact, um, there is a zero one anomaly that was proposed by Pietro and Luigi in their paper earlier this year, which says there's an anomaly between the U1 instanton, so that's the one that will enhance to the SU2 flavor in the UV, and the one form symmetry. So here, this is just basically um, morals being B cup B. So this is the background for the one form symmetry. And one question is, how does that actually match? Or how does get that, how is that realized in the UV? And the proposal that they made is it's just given in terms of W2 of this flavor symmetry bundle, and then B cut B or the point of conjuring mean square root of B over two. So there's a problem with this, potentially a problem with this anomaly in the UV. First of all, this is actually not closed, and they could in fact be additional contributions. And in fact, one contribution that would actually sort of cancel this anomaly or make this anomaly um, uh, sort of closed and also would exactly tell us that there's actually no anomaly in, in the UV is to add a term, which is uh, just again, the C1 of the instanton U1, but then also a one form B1 delta B1. And now you could ask, where is that actually coming from? And it's sort of a nice observation if you go to the Higgs branch of the SU2 theory. So we heard in Cyril's talk where if you deform the singularity, we usually pop out some three cycles. In this case, for the SU2, there's an S3 mod Z2 in the geometry. And so we, in the M theory setup, this would exactly be, in fact, uh, a 3D defect theory coming from you now M5 brains wrapping that S3 mod Z2. So this is a proposal of how that anomaly, in fact, is actually absent. So in the gauge theory, you would see that because you only see the, the degrees of freedom from the gauge theory description. But in fact, in the full um, so string theory background, you will see these additional sectors. There's also a way to argue for the two group from a brain web point of view. Um, so this is sort of the brain web for this SU2 zero theory. And we said the one-form symmetry can be computed by looking at just the PQ5 brain charges 
and put them in a matrix computer smith smoothing form. So M can be written as some integral matrix A1 smith normal form, which is this here, times A2. And this is basically the matrix, some SL2Z matrix that will sort of act on the, these P2 5 pin charges and bring them into this form here. And so here we see again the Z21 form symmetry. So now, in fact, thinking of this A2 and applying this to the background fields for the one form symmetry, these are now B2 and C2 in the 2B uh, 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 theory. Um, these have to be such that two times, say, if, we, if C2 is the background, then two times DC2 has to be trivial. So, in fact, F3 has to be valued in H3 of uh, the five manifold of the Z2 coefficient. And similar, you could also formulate in the S day frame, where now B2 is the background for the one form symmetry, then H is DB2 is an element in the third cohomology with Z2 coefficients. So what this means is that actually this means there is a background, a torsional background in this brain web um, with an SNS flux that's torsional in this, this form. And in fact, going back to some very early works of, of uh, Anton Kapustin, uh, this is in fact an interpretation is a box team of a W2, where this W2 is precisely an obstruction lifting SU2 mod Z2 to U2. And so here, this box team is a slightly different box team map because it comes from an extension that looks like this. So we have a Z, Z, Z2. So this multiplication by two, this reduction mod two, and the box team is a map from H2 of the Z2 coefficients into H3 with Z coefficients. So in fact, that generates sort of a non-trivial um, potential relation between, again, the zero and the one from some of the backgrounds. So in the brain map, we require an, an H uh, turned on that's um, of this form. And that conjecture is now identified with this W3 that we had in this two group uh, earlier in the geometric analysis. So that's one way to see the two group there. A slightly complementary uh, point of view is to just forget about all this bulk stuff and just think in terms of the reduction on the boundary. So a lot of this analysis, as I said, for the one form symmetry is just dependent on the link geometry. So what happens on this five manifold? So we could ask to determine whether there is the zero one form symmetry anomaly, we should be able to see this from the reduction of the 11 dimensional supergravity on this five dimensional space. And so for example, for SU20, that's simply a Y20, or in fact, Y2 comma two, again, there are these two forms which correspond to uh, F0 or F2. So that's topologically S3 mod Z2 times S2. And we can try to now reduce the 11 dimensional topological terms on that five manifold and ask, are there these, these anomaly terms, right? So the supergravity theory should provide us with all the possible backgrounds for the symmetries of the theory that it constructs. Um, it, con it should give us the background for the one form symmetry, that's B, and in fact, this reduction contains a B cube term, but with an integral coefficient. So there's no one form symmetry anomaly per se, but there is actually no term that's a B squared uh, F1. So this was this uh, anomaly from Pietro Luigi. Now that could hint at the fact that looking at sort of this, this link, you capture all these degrees of freedom, right? So the, it's agnostic as to where you are, Higgs branch, Coulomb branch, it will capture the full, the, the actual anomaly of the theory. It's also a beautiful so picture that this link reduction will actually not depend on the energy scale, which indeed these top anomalies should not depend on that. And so from this analysis, there's no evidence for this uh, mixed anomaly. Okay, so let me, I think I, I started 10 minutes late, right? Uh, five minutes. <laughs> five minutes. Okay. Right. Okay. So let me then focus on the, the maybe the things. Uh, there's just sort of a standard story about when you have a two group symmetry, then there's also maybe that's actually interesting for, for people interested in super conformal index. And um, let me just mention that briefly. I'm almost done. Um, if you gauge the one form symmetry, um, it doesn't seem to be anomalous. We can gauge the one form symmetry. Uh, the 
SU2 zero theory becomes the SO3 zero theory. And the fact that the one from symmetry in the SU2 theory was taking part in this two group then leads to a mixed anomaly in the dual theories in this SO3 theory, there's now a Z2 two form symmetry and an SO3 flavor symmetry and they actually become, there's a mixed anomaly between these two. And so the background for this two form symmetry and the zero form symmetry um, have this uh, sort of mixed anomaly. Okay, so that would be interesting actually. One, one thing that we at the time were not entirely certain about is what actually are the superconformal index computations for non-simply connected gauge groups? Should they be the same? Should they be different? Um, there's a paper by Choi actually saying that the superconformal indices should be the same. And so if that's the case, indeed the flavor symmetry in that case is SO3. But it would be actually very nice to have some more robust insights into also for other theories. And so that brings me also back to this global form of flavor using the same sort of arguments the structure group, you cannot compute for an arbitrary geometry, what are actually the global forms of flavor. And so one sort of nice result is from this of all the rank one theories, the flavor symmetries are always the maximally centered quotient groups. Right, so if I ask you two, zero, it's SO3, but then also all the NF plus ones, always the flavor symmetry is actually the maximally centered quotient one. And that's consistent with the superconformal indices uh, from Kim Kim Lee, where you just look at the reps and indeed there's that flavor symmetry realized. So that's very nice. Um, but there are also other higher rank uh, cases where the flavor symmetry isn't just a maximum centric portion of the ones. It'd be nice to actually check against uh, some index calculations. Okay, let me conclude. So I think we can all get behind the statement that five BSCTs have really interesting zero form symmetries enhanced in the UV. And it seems now we also learned there are some interesting higher form symmetries. Um, I talked about the one form and the dual two form symmetry. But in fact, there's also slight corollary. There's also their models for more exotic singularities that have three form symmetries. And they certainly seem to be a little less understood. And would be interesting to uh, understand them better from, say, for example, this discrete gauging point of view. Um, we've seen that there are these uh, sort of mixings between zero and one form symmetries into two groups. And what would be actually very interesting is to understand what actually is the physics of these things. And these are not that exotic. And so there were papers in class S by Laksha and also uh, for n equals one theories and four dimensions. Uh, there are very, very sort of nice examples of two group symmetries. I think Yuji will talk about this on Friday, so you'll hear uh, something about two groups then as well. So it'd be exciting to actually understand actually what is the physical implication of these. Similar to the one form symmetry in four dimensions, which talks about confinement, what do actually two group symmetries tell us? Okay, so thanks very much for your attention. Okay, so thank you uh, for the speaker. Uh, uh, any questions, Cyril? I think it's just clapping. So, Siri, please talk. No, no, no. I think he. Uh, I was just, just clapping. Yes. Clap yeah. signs and then there are raised hand signs. Which is ah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, any questions? No questions. Okay. Then, can I ask a question? So, sure. Yes. Uh, so, you mentioned that if there is a discrete data angle, then in SU2 theory, then uh, there is no one form symmetry. So yeah. how, how can we see that? Yeah, that's a bit more, you're asking this from the geometry. Yeah, so that's a tricky one because we don't really know how the, the theta angle. So that's more field theoretic point. It'd be actually nice to, so, so that, for example, um, there are indirect ways of seeing it. Uh, for example, the SU2, SU2 quivers with theta angle pi, and mm -hmm. there's a one form symmetry because that also has a dual description in terms of an SU3 with fundamentals or something. I had an example here earlier. Um, but it's true that the theta angle is a bit more obscure in these geometric constructions, right? So yeah, that's, that's a good point. And so this is sort of the example that we're talking about. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So here the flavors basically kill it. So it's mm -hmm. indirect evidence for that. 
it would be nice to actually have this more directly argued from from a construction. I guess you you could say right. It's not something you you need to rely on, right? Because the geometric analysis doesn't really care about what the gauge zero description is. Mm -hmm. As I said, it does just depends on the boundary geometry essentially. So it, it is an indirect way to see it. And I think you're asking, how would you see that uh, more directly from field theory? From field theory, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a uh, well, Sakura, question. can I interject? Uh, yeah. I, I thought, I mean, that one way to see that is the instanton particle will come with half electric charge. I mean, wouldn't that right, already so say? It's similar to the, the Transharmonics level case, right? So, actually, where is it? I had the, the case. Ah, uh -huh, okay, I see. Ah, uh -huh. so it would be like as if you have a fundamental representation yeah, of SU two. Mm -hmm. So okay, so similar yeah. to this case here. Mm hmm. Okay, I okay, I, I understand. Thank you very much. Okay, other questions? Okay, if so, not, uh, can I ask a question? Sorry. Yeah. Sure. Um, so you started the clarification because I don't understand very well. When you say that the global form of the flavor group is PSU3, for example, yeah. if I was thinking about gauging that, does that mean that I have to choose the global form or I can choose the global form if I were to make it dynamic? I think you can only turn on backgrounds are consistent with that, right? Because that's the flavor ah. symmetry. So you have to have but you, you cannot turn on an SU3 bundle. Yeah. So there's a part of the confusing thing because SU3 bundles are all PSU3 bundles. Yeah? That is true. So is it that you have some sort of. Yeah. Is there a particle one can identify? I have the same question for you. Um, is there any particle you can identify in your theories that has um, um, something like a stiffer Whitney class, which is non-trivial of PSU3, and which is dynamical? Right. So the, yeah, so there's, in this SU2 example, one way to think about it is that um, the W boson for this flavor symmetry actually is, is so the W boson is basically charged. Um, mm -hmm. So it really tells you um, yeah, so, okay, so maybe, maybe the point is you might have said the flavor symmetry is SU2, but in fact, there's nothing that is charged under this Z2 that sits in there. Mm -hmm. right, so there, there's some redundancy if you say the flavor is SU2 as opposed to SO3. Because there's actually nothing in the theory that is charged under the Z2. Right, but in that case, we'll generally say that we can choose either SD2 or SO3 as a global form when gauging, right? Yeah, sorry, but that's for the for our gauge theory, no? Yeah, that's one thing. If you if I was to gauge this, uh, would I have a choice or would I say? Right, you're saying if you now gauge this, can you, um, so for example, you want to construct from this a quiver theory. Mm -hmm. So that you blew it another sector or something, like yeah, string theory, you, you, you take the SU2 and now you gauge the SO3 flavor mm -hmm. and you get another event two theory. Yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. mm -hmm. um, so the question is, what is the thing that you get after that? Okay, let me think about it. I can get back to you. And here, basically, right, you're attaching to, to this. What you're saying is you're sort of closing this up here, right? You're making this a compact guy. 
Yeah, actually, I was thinking if, if, you, if you were to embed this in a compact labia, for example, what would I expect yeah. uh, for this reaction? Hmm. But I think you could also gauge that. Um, you can certainly gauge it as those three, and you're asking, so can you ungauge also the center of that? Um, hmm. I want to say yes, but let me think about it. Sure. 